Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH, solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. Thanks for joining us here for This Week in Agribusiness. I'm Mike Pearson. Recently at the Commodity Classic, I had the chance to get up close and personal with a lot of things that are changing in this ag industry. New technology was released, and we'll have a little bit on that later on in the program, but also faces are changing. And I had the chance to catch up with Lucas Lynch, the new CEO of the United Soybean Board, and I asked him how those first few months have gone. The first thing I've learned is it's all about the farmers. Uh, you know, when you're a new CEO of an organization, sometimes people uh, start thinking about the role of CEO. But at the end of the day, I trust farmers and, and the last three months of getting to know America's soybean farmer leadership, if you will, the 77 volunteer board members have been, uh, it's been fantastic and I trust their leadership. Well, let's talk a little bit about where their leadership is headed, Lucas. There's a lot of things changing in the world of soybeans right now. There's a lot of new demand sources and, and new opportunities. Yeah. What has the leadership decided for USB? What issues are you focusing on in 2024? Well, I think sometimes it's important to just remember the three legs of the stool, animal agriculture, the soybean meal that we produce in our country. We've got to have a place to feed it. And that high quality uh, nutrient protein that goes into animal ag is, is huge. So moving the pile is very important. The second leg I always like to talk about is energy independence and the fact that soy oil can be a drop in replacement on, on in petroleum. Think about renewable diesel, biodiesel. It is a drop in replacement on the renewable front. And then, of course, consumer innovations from Skechers, tennis shoes to Goodyear tires to turf. Uh, the innovations seem to be endless, consumer and industrial. Absolutely. And what's been fantastic over the past couple of years, USB, American Soybean Association, have worked together to give farmers and the public the chance to work with some of those. I know at Farm yeah. Progress Show, we've got the soy based asphalt. And you're seeing that more and more places. Yeah, one of the most important things on the innovation front is everybody's kind of got their stick to their knitting, if you will. We know the American Soybean Association really does the, the, the policy work on behalf of farmers. We do the promotion and research at the United Soybean Board. Uh, it, as checkoff funded, uh, it happens uh, really at the bedrock of farmer investment and the qualified state soybean boards across the country. Every farmer is first and foremost a local zip code. And as United Soybean Board, we partner and we think about innovation as a united checkoff. And it's very exciting to be part of it. And what do you anticipate, this is gonna take several years to build this sort of ecosystem that we're watching, right? For, for swapping out petroleum yeah. for well, bio you, products? You know, whether you're talking about sustainable aviation fuel, and there's a lot of uh, conversation in that landscape right now. But whether it's the skies, whether it's the rail, you still have to have engines running on the, on the train tracks, delivering commodities to market and our infrastructure across the country. Or if you're talking about uh, marine, think about the marine uh, use of renewable energy and renewable fuels. I mean, it's, it's really uh, an exciting time for the American farmer. Uh, and I think that's the important part. For the last three decades, farmers have been investing in their checkoff. And it isn't, uh, it isn't always about what's in it for me in this exact moment. It's about building the investment pipeline so that as your commodity gets to market this year, next year, the year after, there is value in the supply chain waiting for you to create demand. And it's also not just demand creation, it's also supply. And Excellent. high quality supply is essential. Yes, it's all about that high quality supply. That was Lucas Lynch, the new CEO of the United Soybean Board, highlighting the opportunities for demand coming later this year. Today's larger, heavier equipment can lead to more soil compaction issues. Firestone Ag IFVF tires with 82 technology maximize load capacity while minimizing soil compaction. Visit firestoneag.com to learn more. Now it's time to talk markets. Joining us this week is Garrett Toy of Ag Trader Talk. And Garrett, we've seen the corn market come back over the past couple of weeks from that 410 low. Where does it go from here? That's a very good question. Last week we saw a fairly decent amount of short covering. Funds covered about 45,000 contracts of their money market short. Um, the problem is we didn't really rally that much, you know. So uh, commercials were real willing and able to sell this rally um, and kind of gave the funds an easy out, you know. And with the USDA report coming here, um, you know, I think that uh, that market at this point, you know, the, the carryouts aren't going to change a whole lot. Uh, I think we're basically going to have a reiteration of a remind everyone what the bearish fundamentals are. Uh, with a slightly smaller South American production. Uh, but, um, you know, I think we, we're at a level, though, right now, where we're finding demand in corn, and demand is good. 
Uh, but unfortunately, folk is going to turn to new crop here fairly quickly. As you think about that new crop, Garrett, is this shrinking of the Brazilian crop going to give uh, any tailwind to that December corn futures? Um, not yet. Um, you know, I was just looking at some research pieces that we put out yesterday. Um, you know, combined South American corn production, you know, as of the February report is about 7 million metric ton bigger than it was at this point last year. Um, so we have <laughs> we have some cushion. Uh, in soybeans, it's about 12 million metric tons. So um, the fact of the matter is, is this Argentine crop is about double what it was at this point last year because they had such a massive drought. Um, and uh, that, that creates some cushion. Now, um, the market did what it was trying to do in February is in push the crop insurance prices down, trying to contract that acreage pie. Um, but, you know, we're 30 days out, you know, and, and you're, you're looking at things that could possibly change in this market. Planting delays would be bullish. What's going to cause a short covering event to cause these money market shorts to get out? Planting delays, that sort of thing. Well, you've got 40% of the Corn Belt in drought conditions, so things are going to have to change considerably uh, to get to uh, some planting delays concerns. Uh, the other aspect is, is is prevent plant. You know, our big thing that cuts in the overall acreage pie, pie is that prevent plant in the northern plains. They're dry as well. So we have to see a weather pattern change here in the U.S. Very well possible, you know, but um, at this point, it's you know, when, we, when we're setting the earliest 80 degree temperature for Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, you know, this year than any other year. Uh, it's tough to get too concerned about planting delays. It is, it is. And Garrett, so that's on the corn side, not a whole lot of optimism mm -hmm. out there. The wheat market continues to look less and less optimistic by the day. What happened this week? Well, we fell out of bed. Um, you know, Wednesday's trade was pretty negative. Um, what I'm hearing is China canceled uh, three to four cargoes of the U.S. soft red wheats that they had bought back in December. Um, kind of a follow through from the Algerian tender that we had earlier in the week. Uh, Russian wheat prices are very cheap, um, and the French have uh, traded new contract lows. There's abundant French wheat supplies. I think that um, you know, these exporters are looking at the transition to new crop, and they have a bunch of old crop wheat to sell before that comes online, so they're, they're really trying to dump it on the market. Uh, but the Chinese, um, that's the big thing that's kind of supported the U.S. soft red wheat market, uh, has been this Chinese book. The last four or five weeks, they've loaded about a cargo a week, but, um, you know, it's expensive from versus where they bought it in December, so they can buy it cheaper elsewhere. All right, so the downward trend looks set to continue in Chicago wheat? Unfortunately, well, we're just basically going to take the Chicago wheat back down towards world prices because we have right. been supported a little bit. All right, so that's that mid $5 range is where we're five at? Five and roughly. fifty, five and a quarter, yeah. All right, things to watch here in these markets. Garrett, when we come back, we're going to dig in what's happening here in the soybean trade. Leave it here. More coming with Garrett Toy of Ag Trader Talk. Today's larger, heavier equipment can lead to more soil compaction issues. Firestone Ag IFVF tires with 82 technology maximize load capacity while minimizing soil compaction. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more. And we're back talking markets with Garrett Toy of Ag Trader Talk. Garrett, let's dive into this soybean market. We have seen this downward slide in the soybean trade for the past several months. With Brazil's crop coming out, are we near a point that that slide could stop? Yeah, I mean, the harvest has reached 50% complete, so you're always that time of year looking for a seasonal harvest low. You got to remember, you know, there's two harvests now uh, globally. Um, the interesting thing is, is uh, you know, I think uh, you know, last week we had uh, that bounce in futures. The Brazilian rally, uh, the Brazilian farmer actually engaged here a little bit, um, and you saw their, their premiums had firmed over a week of 10 days, where they firmed about 10 to 15 cents. Um, now they're starting to ease back. However, while the Brazilian farmer is selling, um, the demand offtakes are pretty decent. So now you're, you're at the point now where there's not enough farmers selling out of Brazil uh, to, uh, to offset that. What does it mean in the long run? The funds still added to shorts this past week. They're still very short. Um, the, I, think, I think the farmer in the U.S. has more corn to sell than soybeans at this point, obviously. But if we're seeing a short covering event, which everybody's looking for at some point or waiting on, I should say, um, the the South American farmer and the U.S. farmer are in the same boat. You know, yeah. they're they're going to be they're going to reward a rally when it happens. So, um, you know, I think we're kind of at this equilibrium point, if you will, where you know the funds have established a deep enough short. However, uh, rallies, you know, 1150, 1175 are going to are really going to be rewarded by the South American farmer and what's left of the U.S. farmer. All right, so that 1175, that's going to be that next level of resistance here in the May. Yeah, you know, it's very odd. You know, uh, you know. And the, the, the research shows that you know $11 is kind of a pivot point for November. It's well advertised. Um, you know the fact that we're kind of here. You know $12 is going to be resistance. 
I think the bean acres numbers are going to be pretty big uh, at the end of the month, and that may pressure things and, again, focus the new crop. But, um, you know, it's going to see how long we're going to stay in this $11 range. All right. Things to watch there in beans. Garrett, I want to turn our focus over to the cattle market. Mm -hmm. Again, that has just been a wild 18 months. It's been a wild three years in the cattle right. market. We're coming back from that, uh, that fourth quarter low. Have we peaked this springtime rally? Is there still more optimism in live cattle looking at the summer? Market feels a little tired right now. Um, and I think that if you're a producer, you have to be looking at hedging something. Um, whether it's LRP, um, I know that you can lock in fall LRP prices at uh, above all-time high index prices. So, um, you know, you really you can fall out of the boat and hit water <laughs> sort of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I think at these levels, uh, you'd be remiss not to be hedging something. Uh, it's the most prudent thing to do. Um, but... Uh, the market feels a little bit tired here. Uh, off the cattle on feed numbers, um, you know, we've, we cash was higher and it didn't really necessarily react positively. Uh, we've set back, but we haven't fallen out of bed per okay. se. So um, uh, it, we're just kind of consolidating, although I don't think going forward, it's, I think it's going to be tougher to push into new highs at these levels. All right, Garrett, given, given what you know about the cattle industry, is this a time for producers to, does it still make sense to get out there and buy those bread heifers? <laughs> well, Look at the long game. The, 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 long, the long game, I mean, bread heifers, I'm hearing, you know, they, they've, they've softened. That market has definitely softened a little bit, um, but the cattle and feed still showing us feeding heifers. Um, you know, from what I've seen, you know, bread cows were 2,600 last summer uh, out of the southwest. Um, I'm hearing 21 down to 1,800 on bread heifers now, which are still, you know, grand scheme of things would pencil yeah. <laughs> crazy enough um so um yeah i mean it, it, i think that for those who want to assume that risk and do the work right. um and try to expand the herd it, it, there's going to be a reward there for them all right well that's good to hear it'd be nice to see some long-running strength in that cattle complex make those cattle producers whole yet again garrett toy of ag trader talk as always thanks for joining us this week thank you on Friday's March World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates Report, world production was in focus as traders hoped to learn more about the crop size in South America. USDA reported the corn crop in Brazil was unchanged with their estimates from last month at 124 million metric tons. Argentina saw its corn crop grow by 1 million metric tons, though harvest remains several weeks away. For soybeans, the Brazilian crop size was reduced by about 1 million metric tons to 155 million, though that is still higher than many other estimates. For the United States, officials made few changes to the supply and demand balance sheets, with ending stocks for corn remaining the same as last month and a small increase in stocks for both soy and wheat domestically. With all of the changes figured up, world corn ending stocks declined by nearly 3 million metric tons, soybean stocks declined by almost 2 million, and even global wheat stocks showed a slight decline of half a million metric tons. Greg Sodier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Yes, indeed. Greg Solier is here with a look at what's to come from a weather perspective. And Greg, the Pacific Northwest continues yep. to be wet. What's this next week hold? Uh, more to come. Uh, it's time to get those folks uh, balanced on the El Nino precipitation books here. What, at least up to this point over the past couple of weeks, had been slightly disappointing and certainly lesser than usual. But here's the next in a series of these El Nino driven storms offshore of Northern California. Wind and widespread, uh, significant, fast moving, mind you, complete coverage moisture, high snow levels, and uh, an absence, by the way, of Arctic air. The cold air has moved north and eastward, so this downslope flow continues to generate uh, some wind and certainly an erosion again of what's been there, and it's been minimal at best here the past few weeks. Snowpack and snow cover. We are in the midst of a drought and a snow drought, for that matter, out of big sky across the Dakotas and points out of the east, and don't think there's going to be much improvement to that, here at least from a snow standpoint, going forward over the next couple of weeks. So there's that system in Northern California, bees lines out towards Big Sky Country. Eh, some rain, rain. <laughs> Here we go again. Rain and a little bit of wet snow. Black Hills down into Nebraska. Despite the uh, plethora of weather systems on the move, uh, we're still looking at some worsening drought conditions across parts of the plains and western Corn Belt locales. Weaker weather system back in the Pacific Northwest, but otherwise high pressure builds on in. So it's an active weather pattern through the Pacific Northwest. And how about California? Boy, it hasn't been since about 2015 since we put the back-to-back. 
years of above average moisture and mainly snowfall snowpack across the Sierra ranges now running at about 25 inches. That's the water equivalency of the snow up there across the peaks. And how about that storm 10 days ago? Almost 200 mile an hour winds of the peaks and a quick uh, burst of six foot snows. Here is the next weather system into California. Weak high pressure desert southwest wind and warmth. And this is another problem down here. The fires and uh, at least the uh, wind issues wildfires into West Texas, parts of Oklahoma and New Mexico. So we're back into that scenario early in the week. We do get this weather system to move in the desert southwest and some opportunity while it's severe to generate some showers and thunderstorms, slightly colder air and a rain snow mix moving in to uh, areas of Nebraska back into sunshine later in the week for the valleys of California. Taking a look at the Corn Belt, Greg, you mentioned that dryness. Any possibility of alleviation in this next week? Well, you know, we get these fast moving systems. We get a little bit of moisture to percolate on in and then you get these warm ups that get going and we're still in line here the next 10 days or two weeks to probably push another incredibly warm air mass into the plains and Corn Belt locales. And here is that demarcation line readings well above average across the western Corn Belt back into the plains. Uh, a couple of sprinkles of snowflakes for the Great Lakes region. By the time we get to the middle and late portions of the week, a quick jump here on the maps and charts to cooler air here, buckling jet stream pattern and maybe some opportunity to pick up showers and thunderstorms, would you believe, out of the plains and western and southern Corn Belt locales back into warm weather for the Midwest. Any semblance of winter time would be up towards the Sioux and back west through Big Sky Country. Again, wind and warmth and fire potential and hot weather into West Texas, New Mexico, uh, Oklahoma Panhandle Country. Uh, the warmth across the winter wheat fields, they are breaking uh, dormancy and they need rain. We're seeing improvement overall but still deficit mode, but we do get in some showers and thunderstorms here with a system out of the Rio Grande and parts of Mexico later in the week. Opportunities for field work moving along nicely between the rains across the Delta and points on east. All right, Greg, well, looking further to the east, what are you watching over this next week? Yeah, we're keeping an eye on uh, the absence of cold air, with the exception of the northeast of New England. It'll feel like mid to late winter time there. Nice warm up for the Midwest. Here's the next fast moving Pacific weather system and a bunch of warmth across areas of the western Corn Belt into the plains that'll be sliding to the eastern and southern Corn Belt and middle to late portions of the week. It's rain back in the forecast. The dryness and drought issues are growing across areas of the northern plains, upper Midwest, Canadian Prairie, the lack of snowfall this winter time season. Southeastern states, plenty of opportunity for outdoor work from the Carolinas into eastern Texas. A couple of showers and thunderstorms getting going there. And in the late portions of the week, we'll keep an eye on showers and thunderstorms heavy and severe. Delta on westward opportunities. Field work continue on in through Georgia back into the Florida Panhandle. Closed captioning for this week in agribusiness is brought to you by Pentair Hypro, a global leader in innovative spray technology for farmers for over 75 years. Yes, folks, if you haven't had a chance to make it to an agriculture focused trade show recently, it's worth it. New innovations are coming out right and left. I had the chance to talk crop protection innovation with David Reif, one of the agronomists with Vive Crop Protection. So what we're really focusing on is that early season stand uh, standability. So uh, we're, we're protecting that small seedling from, you know, if you've got uh, cold, wet, mid Midwest soils, we're just seeing better emergence better stand and reduced infection of disease early on, which turns into some really phenomenal yield results later on. So now you've got this data, you're planning ahead for the 2024 crop season. For growers in your northern region, David, what are you encouraging them to think about as they look ahead to this year? 2024 is, uh, you know, like every other year, it's a, it's a different challenge in its own way. And commodity prices are obviously on everybody's minds. So getting consistent returns on your investment is, is always huge in what farmers need to think about. And I always like to uh, encourage farmers to utilize a systems approach because you always need a plan for success in order to achieve success. And utilizing inputs that can provide consistent results and help you manage the, the key problems on your farm is, 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 what you, is what you really need to be considering thinking about. And Asteroid FC 3.3 has uh, on average brought f farmers six bushels per acre. And for the cost that it brings, it's uh, probably two and a half to three X ROI, which is, you know, really, really, really good. And it's very consistent across the, the Midwest. It is indeed. David, well, I've got your agronomist mind on hand, corn rootworm. Hearing more about that continues to be a problem across uh, across the, the country. But what are you seeing from Vive's uh, perspective to address that challenge? Vive Crop Protection offers Bifender FC, which is a phenomenal corn rootworm product. Uh, just corn rootworm in general. It's been a very mild winter 
and uh, I think a lot of farmers have some concerns about uh, insect pressure this next year, and rightfully so. And protecting your your corn roots, corn rootworm from corn rootworm, um, it's a it's a must do across the Midwest. David, we've seen growers get a lot more engaged in their agronomics in the past several years. I'm sure a lot of these issues get brought to your attention. What are you hearing? What do you think farmers need to be aware of across the U.S.? So in the 2023 season, working with local farmers across the Midwest, we saw a lot more corn nematode problems. And that's often a problem that, that growers tend to think they don't have. And with pulling several soil samples, uh, we quite often found that in trouble areas of the field, so, so typically farmers have problem areas, and we always think it's pH, or we think it's compaction, or we think it's fertility. And sometimes that can be corn nematodes. So how does Vive uh, propose a solution for growers? So Vive has a couple of options, one, one in particular, uh, and that would be Averland FC nematicide, and we recommend applying that in furrow uh, with your corn seedling or with your corn seed to, uh, to give it a zone of protection for um, the early part of the season. David, if we've got audience members who want to learn more about Vive, where would you recommend they go? I would go to our website, vivecrop.com, and also work with your local Vive regional sales manager. That was David Reif, the northern agronomist with Vive Crop Protection, but crop protection weren't the only new technologies on display. Dave Postel, a senior vice president at AGI, talked me through the history of their company and the tech they're excited about looking forward. So AGI started about 25 years ago. We built out around portable handling, permanent handling, storage bins. And as we saw the market change, we realized that growers more and more need better information to make better decisions. So how can we make our equipment smart? The first place it led it to was grain monitoring, bin monitoring. We started a product in Canada and then expanded here in the US with the addition of, of the bin manager line. This we thought was a home run. Immediately it became successful. And then we began to go, well, in what other ways can we provide information and connect uh, a broader theme of monitoring to AGI. So we do bin monitoring, then we moved into Farm Mobile, which provides machine monitoring, field level monitoring, and we also had a line of equipment under the CMC brand that did hazard monitoring. So same sort of thing, in uh, elevators, longer temperature only ca cables, as well as uh, bearing and belt sensors that detect temperature and avoid risk. So all really under the brand of Better information makes for safer, more profitable operations. All right. We continue to see farmers focusing on digital technology, bringing that onto their operation. From AGI's perspective, what about that trend is most encouraging? What would you like to see continued the most? Well, honestly, I, I am most inspired by the fact that a lot of it comes from a safety perspective. How do we make farming safer? You know, there's often three generations, you know, Grandpa, me, the 50-year-old, my kids, we're all climbing grain bins. Farming is a dangerous business. There's technology now that reduces that. Maybe it doesn't take it all away, but reduces that. So that for me is the most exciting thing. The other sort of equally uh, or close second for me is the way uh, farms have become more sophisticated. Farmers run very complicated operations. They're making decisions about cost about uh, about hedging their their very crop you know so uh, I think it, we're at a really exciting point so we'll continue if you think of the basic elements safety visibility remote control now we have EMC curves to help drive automation in the grain bin imagine what comes next with AI right and we're on the cusp of some really exciting things that will you know we can do a lot with science now, science backed by an AI model. Wow, wait till you see what happens. And then we continue to connect what's happened in the field with what's happened in the bin, and we start to build out a whole sustainability, traceability plan. I think the future is incredibly exciting. Thanks to Dave Postel for giving us that update on AGI's company history. And folks, stick with us. We'll have more This Week in Agribusiness when we come back. Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH, solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. 
Yes, it won't be long now and growers across the country will be out there in their machines taking care of their crops growing in the fields. A key part of that is keeping the weed pressure at bay and perhaps propane could play a bigger role in that going forward. Joining me now is Mike Newland. He's the Director of Agriculture Business Development at the Propane Education and Research Council. Mike, you're seeing more propane get used for weeding, aren't you? We are. Uh, it's a pretty unique application or way of, of going about it, but uh, it's something that's been proven in the organic space for a number of years now. It's in the organic space. Mike, how long have they been working with this technology? So the technology has been around for decades, to be honest with you. And what we're talking about is using open fire or flames to control weeds. Um, so the organic space has been using it, uh, as I mentioned, for decades. A lot of people around the farm may be used to using a handheld torch. And it's really just taking that technology and making it much bigger uh, to use in the field. Mike, if, if I've never seen one of these in the field, walk me through what I'm looking at. What is this technology, this unit that's flaming these weeds? Yeah, it'd be, it's a toolbar that has torches mounted on the back of it. They're electronically controlled for safety reasons and, and ease of, of lighting them. Uh, but all the way up to 16 rows now. Um, uh, so we can do a, a wide path of, uh, of control. And uh, in a typical system, we'd, we'd do a burn down in the spring, burn down as in, um, in, in the chemical terms mm -hmm. anyway. And then we also have the ability to do in-crop applications as well. How late in the season can you do an in-crop application with heat? Well, I was going to say, that's where we get a little, I get a little concerned with an agronomy background. I'm very concerned as we get into soybeans because of growing points and where they are. Early post on corn doesn't concern me. We've got the growing point below ground, so that's a pretty safe application. But we use, use heat shields during uh, the soybean applications to make sure we don't uh, impact the growing point. Mike, as I think about other issues impacting the ag industry, resistant weeds is a huge one. Can flame weeding be a solution? I think it can be, and I think it should be considered. Uh, if you're in a conventional corn soybean rotation and are fighting herbicide resistant weeds, I think maybe it's, a, it's worth a look at this technology. Could you do 100% of your corn acres every single year with the technology? Maybe, maybe not, depending on the size of your farm. But I think it could warrant maybe a rotational approach to where you're doing half or a third of your acres every single year to keep that weed bank down and uh, kind of keep the herbicide resistant population at bay. That makes sense. Mike, is this something that PERC has written research on with your website? It is, uh, propane.com on our ag page. There's an entire page uh, dedicated to, to weed flaming. Uh, so all the research, all the companies that we've partnered with and some uh, OEM equipment companies are listed there. Fantastic. That's a great resource, folks. Check that out for Mike Newland, the Director of Agriculture Business Development at PERC. Greg Sodia is back now with his extended farm weather forecast for the nation. Well, it's time to take a look at what's to come for weather in the week ahead. Greg, you mentioned some precipitation. Who's going to get what and where? Well, as the week wears on, especially later in the week, things will get pretty active across the uh, heartland. And uh, just because, you know, we've seen these weather maps and charts uh, and significant moisture of late across the Midwest, still lacking into the western Corn Belt and the Plains, this is not the way. We'll just put these uh, rumors to rest of the way the spring planting season will go. We anticipate plenty of windows of opportunity. We should, at least from a Corn Belt, standpoint be out there more often than not. But this week uh, we'll get into enough cold air, higher terrain to get some snow going and we need it here. We need the moisture of the western Corn Belt, maybe an inch or two. Severe weather potential Ohio Valley down to Texas and spreading through the Gulf Coast areas later in the week. Another inch or two or three in the parts of northern California, the Pacific Northwest. We do foresee this pattern winding down, Mike, here in the next two or three weeks. All right, well, let's take a look at that next week, the week of March 18th. Greg, spring is underway. That precipitation still there? Yeah, I did. well, the temperatures have been really the story early and often on this spring mode. Here it is. Spring clocks in on the 19th, uh, a little after 10 o'clock in the central time zone. Another run is some record, a near record setting warmth uh, expected to shift from the upper Midwest and plains across the Corn Belt into the northeast of New England. Slight dip in the jet stream pattern. And again, we've got uh, moisture and we'll take it. Uh, not probably enough to end the 
drop, but some improvement for the Dakotas back across the western state. Severe weather potential Dixie down across areas of Texas too into the Ohio Valley, drying out over the southeastern portions of the country. So some added drought relief as well where we need it across the southwestern sections of the country. Then above average weather. Greg, does that expand further westward in the weeks to come? Uh, the temperatures are going to remain very delightful. Yeah, there's a little bit of a back building, uh, backing up of retrogression of the weather pattern. And we do see that up aloft at times. And so the warm ridge relative to uh, mid to late uh, March and uh, coming up on the Easter season as well here on the 31st. Uh, phenomenal one. No need for probably extra layers on the uh, Easter bonnet from the Plain States across the upper Midwest into the Northeast and New England. Temperatures a bit below normal as you get into the Western states. Normal across the Eastern Gulf Coast. So lots of warmth in any way you want to shape it from the desert southwest into the plains and across the Corn Belt. We do get into this window of opportunity here if you want to get things going in some areas for outdoor work and planting operations over the Midwest. Wet weather down through the uh, southeastern states into Texas and Oklahoma. Good news here. Pacific Northwest uh, precipitation about normal. So two jet stream patterns, one across the middle part of the country and the southern branch, but weakening with El Nino in control over the deep south and southeastern sections of the country. Greg, what do you see developing on that first full week of April? Anything stick out to you? Uh, nothing too foolish here. Uh, we think that it'll be a bit chillier than average. No real significant cold. This is a progressive weather pattern. Things are going to begin to move here. And hopefully we think of farm equipment too from a planning standpoint across the heartland. It ought to still be going full tilt over the deep south and southeastern parts of the country. In between the outbreaks of moisture, uh, the temperature pattern is above average for the western parts of the country. And yeah, here's a nice ridge of high pressure over the plains moving into the western Corn Belt, wet weather for the Ohio Valley and southeastern states, but that too shall pass. Our Farm Progress Roundup is brought to you by Brandt Industries. Lead the field with Brandt's lineup of highly effective and efficient high-speed discs and land rollers. Visit Brandt.ca for more. Agriculture runs deep in Farm Progress employees' DNA. Recently, it was brought to my attention that Brent Murphy, the editor of Delta Farm Press's family, was introduced into the Arizona Farm and Ranch Hall of Fame. He joins us this week to talk about his family operation and what he's doing now. Brent, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Welcome. Let's, let's talk about that family farm and ranch in Arizona. What, what all was that like growing up on? Well, it, it was, I, how can you express how wonderful it is <laughs> to grow up in agriculture. I, uh, we grew up on a small farm uh, outside of Phoenix, Arizona, and it had, uh, we had uh, farming areas, uh, farmed in areas that had been overcome by uh, urban development, have finally moved out to the Maricopa area and uh, farmed out there with my dad and my mom and my sister and, and two brothers. And uh, it was a, in retrospect, maybe not at the time, but uh, it was absolutely a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful experience. I believe that, Brent, and of course, you've carried those, those education experiences with you through life. What brought you over to Delta Farm Press? What connected you with Farm Progress? With Farm Progress, I had actually come out to the Memphis area to work for the cotton industry. I was working for the cotton board. and. Uh, a position came open with uh, Delta Farm Press and actually it was with Farm Press. I was the content director for a year or two with uh, Southwest Farm Press and Western Farm Press. And when the editor position came open at Delta Farm Press, uh, I ju happily jumped on that. And I mean, it's their flagship publication here in the Delta. And uh, it, it, it was something that I had read for, for years and uh, absolutely enjoyed the writers. I really thought of them as another class of journalists compared to what I was doing. I was doing in-house promotions and communications for the uh, for the cotton industry, and had done uh, had been a magazine editor for a couple of years and worked for a publishing company or a company that owned a couple of newspapers, and uh, it was fell in line with my education. I have a degree in journalism. And I thought, well, I'd like to do something substantial. And um, I, I, I hope this is substantial. Uh, in my mind, it is what we do for the growers, what we do for the farmers and the industry that reads our publication. Um, I really think of myself as an advocate and, and the people that work with me as advocates for, for 
the agriculture industry. We need so much of that today. We do indeed, Brent. Can you give us the highlight of a recent story or recent issue you've covered that, uh, that our audience could go and check out? Well, uh, for me, it was really interesting. We have uh, always, when, where I grew up in the West, we, we were always concerned about water use and we were always talking about water efficiency. So when I moved out here, I was interested in a lot of the water stories and a lot of the things that were happening out here were not dissimilar to what had happened in the West. And uh, so we had a, um, a story that came up about water efficiency in Stuttgart, Arkansas, that we uh, tapped into and with the Dobbs family there and just really had uh, a great uh, time talking with them and bringing their story to light. So much to see there across the Delta region. Brent Murphy, editor of Delta yeah. Farm Press, thanks for joining us this week. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be picking up more from Max at Commodity Classic on what's new from the Magnum series at Case IH. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, where we spotlight another great American farm tractor. So you're doing a fine restoration of an old tractor, you want to make sure it's as accurate as possible, right? Even sourcing the parts from a foreign country as they were made there back in the day. Max's Tractor Shed is brought to you by Mystic Lubricants. Mystic Lubricants producers are made to make it last. Well, Sean Marshall in Ontario, Canada has a great looking Ford 3000 that he restored. And back in the day, this tractor didn't come out of Michigan. No, it wasn't North American made. Ford had a plant in Basildon, England. And this 1967 tractor was manufactured in England. And in fact, the canisters for the fuel filters right there on the side of the tractor read made in England. So Sean, when he restored the tractor, made sure that he had the accurate presentation of those fuel filters there. He also has an Alice Chalmers that was made back in the 50s. And you saw the dogs in the shot, that beautiful snow shot with his 3000. He named one of his dogs Alice Chompers. <laughs> That's right, he did. Hey, in a few days, we're going to be in the little town of Sublet, Illinois. That's where they have the annual farm toy show. They pack every building in town almost with farm toy dealers. We haven't been there for a few years. Saturday, March 16th, we'll be there for the farm toy show. We'll have some copies of more stories from the heartland. We look forward to signing some books and saying hello to some of you who can come by and join us there. Mark Stock has a busy schedule every week. Let's see what he's talking about this weekend in his Big Iron Report. Well, Max, as we start the second week of March, we've got some tremendous auctions taking place. Heritage Tractor is a 21-store John Deere dealer located across Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas. And the auction on March the 11th features locally traded high-quality used equipment. Great offering from Heritage Tractor, all selling with no reserve. On March the 12th, Herbert Ruse is retiring his equipment by Havana, Illinois, selling a 2023 John Deere 8R 410 tractor with only 136 hours. 53 of the nicest pieces of farm machinery you'll find being auctioned anywhere on March the 12th. On March the 13th, Max, AgriVision Equipment Group LLC will sell 33 items. Outstanding equipment selling for AgriVision Equipment Group LLC with various locations across Iowa. And Max, if red is your favorite color, please watch the Douglas Wilson auction on March the 14th by Gridley, Illinois. 99 high quality red pieces of machinery. Case IH 2366 Combine. This equipment is outstanding and will sell on March the 14th. And we're just getting started, Max. Outstanding equipment selling the entire month of March and into April on BigIron.com. Our FFA Chapter Tribute is brought to you by Pioneer, developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. And it's time to meet that next generation of agricultural leaders. This week, we're talking with Maggie Livingston. She's serving as the Colorado State FFA reporter for this year. Maggie, thanks for taking the time to talk with us. 
Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. Now, I understand your FFA chapter experience was a little bit unique as you were one of the first members of your chapter. Maggie, what was that like? It was an interesting experience. Um, I ended up switching from orchestra to FFA on a whim, and it was the best decision I ever made. Our chapter was brand new. I'm from the Severance FFA chapter, and my freshman year, I was elected as the reporter. So being the state reporter from the inaugural reporter at Severance just was full circle for me. And working hard those four years to make a chapter is something I'll never forget. You know, that is really a unique experience that not many folks in FFA get to experience. And I'm wondering, Maggie, did you get the chance to really shine in leadership since the chapter was so new? Yeah, it was super important that our officer team um, developed ourselves in order to make the best experience possible for members. My advisor worked hard to train us, to get us the resources we needed, and to make us confident in ourselves because confidence makes the best leaders. It certainly does. And Maggie, this year, of course, as reporter, you're fired up and enjoying your time as a state leader? I am. It's one of the best experiences I've ever had. That is fantastic. And looking out, do you hope to find a career in agriculture? I do. I'm going to attend CSU for ag education this fall and become an ag teacher to inspire students like my ag teacher did for me. Fantastic. It's always good to pay it forward. Well, Maggie Livingston, we wish you the best in your future career within FFA and beyond. Thanks for talking to us this week. Thank you. Colby Ag Tech is brought to you by Copperhead Ag Products. Visit copperheadag.com for more information. Drone technology continues to improve, both on the devices themselves that fly into the air, but importantly, also on the cameras. Our tech expert, Chad Colby, likes to keep up with what's improving in the world of drones, and he's got this update for us. If you've followed our tech segments over the years, you know... And if you watch it long enough, you're going to learn more about the latest in drones. And on this week's tech segment, I just had to share some of the newest sensor technology I'd been working on. You can see this farm set up right here. I was paying close attention to the grain leg. Now, you can do great scouting with drones. That's really the number one reason to have a drone, in my opinion. And here, with a smaller drone, you can see I've zoomed in and was taking just some imagery of the grain leg as far as condition of it. But on this week's segment, I'm going to show a little more advanced. Now, you can see the drone has grown a lot larger in size, and that's to carry a camera. And, of course, we're using RTK now to make sure that we're a little more precise with our location. But the sensor I want you to pay attention to on this next couple parts of the clip. And the reason why is, is notice you can see the map that I'm flying but pay particular attention to the angle of the camera as it takes these photos. Now I've screen recorded the controller there and basically it's capturing imagery from multiple angles and then you can stitch that together. That sensor is the one on the left and the one on the right is the brand new LiDAR sensor. And if you're not familiar with LiDAR, what it does is it basically sends out light waves to the environment or straight down wherever you're pointing the pulses bounce off whatever it hits, comes back, and it essentially calculates that distance. And one of my favorite features, as you can see here, you can see the LiDAR scans right on the controller, which is great, especially when you're out in the field. In the coming weeks, I'm going to share some of the software and some of the results of this data. You'll be really impressed. And there's a lot of applications like looking at this grain leg and even on the construction side that people are using this almost daily. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thank you, Chad. I tell you, it looks a lot easier to send that drone to the top of the grain leg than sending me up a ladder. Folks, leave it here. We'll have more This Week in Agribusiness when we come back. Yes, it was hard to miss all the gleaming paint on display at the trade show floor at Commodity Classic. Now, naturally, Max Armstrong found his way over to the Case IH booth and had the chance to catch up with Morgan Dietrich about what's coming in the newest releases for that Case Magnum series tractor. For model year 25, we have a bunch of new models that we're really excited about. When we think about what we're trying to do with the Magnum, we really want to talk about the technology that this thing enables. We're coming to it in a different way than we've done in the past, where we've had an a la carte kind of technology packaging. Now we're going to have a core bundle and an advanced bundle that's going to be much simpler for our salespeople and our customers to know 
What is coming enabled on this machine? Is there anything we should know about the screen, what it's going to look like, and how it would perform? Yeah, this has been the Pro 1200 for several years now. That's going to stay the same, but now it's really about what the enablement comes from that display. We're going to put the Vector Pro receiver in base equipment. We're going to move to AFS-1 for our guidance base offering, and we're going to have section control move from 16 to 128 sections, all in base equipment. Oh my goodness, that does allow a lot of flexibility, doesn't it? Absolutely. No doubt much of this came from grower feedback. I mean, producers are not at all shy, are they, in telling you what they want? Yes, absolutely. They, if you listen to a grower today, they want simpler, and tell me what this machine can do to me, what problems can it solve? That's why we're really excited about all these changes and what that's gonna do, not only for Magnum, but our other platforms going forward. Lest we forget, Magnum has been around a few years now. I believe uh, it's 37. 37? Seriously. I lost track uh, over all of these years. It served so well through its various iterations. In that technology area, I mean, there is just so much that is important there. Tick off the top two or three things that you heard from farmers about. Yeah, it really is about guidance and giving them the opportunity to select the guidance correction signal that they want. AFS-1 and base, but many customers need a greater accuracy signal and they want to move into RTK or RTK yeah, Plus. Right. It's really the ability to give them that flexibility for what they need for their operation. Well, thank you, Max, for that conversation. And it's got me wondering if it's time to put RTK on that 560 of yours. Well, folks, do be sure to catch us next week. We'll have more Max Armstrong. He'll be here in the studio, so you don't want to miss it. Tune in next weekend, same time, same place, right here for This Week in Agribusiness. Have a great week, everybody. This Week in Agribusiness has been brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge. Equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by 22 Creative Group and has been a presentation of Farm Progress Broadcast. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.